Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Jay and welcome to Simple Church Online. Whether you missed last Sunday, you're checking us out for the first time, or maybe even watching out of state, we're so glad that you're a part of our community. And we're praying today that as you watch, God would use this to bless your life. Enjoy the message. be a little heavy and I wanted to get very real with relationships and marriage because we don't talk about that enough in the church and I want to recognize some things before we get into this series before we get started uh, I want to recognize that there are people in here right now who are, are holding on by a thread in their marriage and this is gonna be very heavy for you my heart breaks for you uh, but there is truth in God's word for you I know there are people who are walking through a separation right now and this is going to be really, really difficult to walk through. There are people uh, who've walked through a separation, who walked through a divorce, who walked through a bad marriage, who walked through uh, divorce, who walked through all of these things. And so just know that we've been praying for you over this past week. We, myself, the staff, we've been praying specifically for those. But this is not going to be an easy conversation. But it's a conversation that needs to be had. The, the, the fact that the do- divorce rate is the same inside the church as outside of the church tells me we are not talking enough about this. And I also know that Jesus and Paul spent a lot of time talking about love and marriage, intimacy, all of these things. And it's time for the church to reclaim these things that God gave to us and stop letting the world shape our belief about relationships and love and marriage and intimacy, intimacy because it's ruining it. I went to – I was going to post a – a uh, dad joke about marriage just to kind of get things going. I could not find a single one that wasn't negative about marriage. Not a single joke that was not negative about how bad marriage is. Broke my heart. We've allowed the world to take something that's so beautiful, so God-given, and turn it into something that is a life sentence. And it's hard, and it's a grind, and all these things. And some of that's true. Let's get real about it. Some of these things are true. But there's also a lot of truth in God's word that counter what the world tries to tell us about marriage and relationships. And it's about time that we dove into that and let that be the truth that speaks over our lives and our marriages. Amen. And so that's the goal of this series. Now, some of the stuff we're going to talk about will apply to all relationships, going to re- re- uh, apply to uh, you know, parent-kid relationships. A lot of it is going to be spouse relationships. And if you're here right now and you're a little bit older, you're like, well, how does this apply to me? You can always be better in your marriage, I promise you. You can, until until the dying day, we're going to be growing together and learning from each other. But I would also challenge you to be thinking about taking this information and sharing with a couple that you know that doesn't go to church. That maybe you need to be praying over them specifically and sharing this information with them. Maybe you've gone through divorce and you're single and you're here and like, hey, how does this apply to me? Well, this could be some good information if you choose to step back into this or... Again, there may be people that you know who are walking through something you walk through, and this will be good information for them. For you young people, I would just challenge you, you know, this whole marriage thing. I know some of you think it's forever off, but start right now having a biblical idea of what marriage looks like, what it looks like to have a partner and all of those things. So we're going to talk about all of these things. I want you to be open-minded. I want you to, to really allow the Spirit to speak because I, I said this last week. If you're a hammer, all you're looking for is nails, Right? And so as we go through this series, if you want to choose to get upset about things, if you want to choose to to think that we're painting certain genders, that's fine. Get mad. That's on you. But I'm asking you to let the Spirit speak the truth of God into your life. And if you're outside of of God's will and, and you're not a Christ follower, I can't really speak too much into your marriage. Good luck. I hope that it works out. But I have some truth from God's word for those who follow Christ about how great your relationship, your marriage can be. And we're going to talk about that today. Before we do that, I want to get really depressed. Can we do that? <laughs> as, as most of you know, almost 50% of marriages in the United States will end in, the, in divorce or separation. Researchers estimate that 41% of all fir- first marriages will end in divorce. 60% of all second marriages end in divorce. 73% of all third marriages end in divorce. And it goes on and on and on the more you get married. Every 42 seconds, there is a a divorce in America. That equates to 86 divorces per hour, 2,046 divorces per day, 14,364 divorces per week, and 746,971 divorces per year. 
There are nearly three divorces in the time it takes a couple to recite their wedding vows, if they take two minutes. More than 172 divorces occur during a typical romantic comedy. So while you're watching Hitch or, or How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, 172 couples are divorcing. You having fun yet? 430 divorces happen during the average wedding reception. The average first marriage ends in divorce. The average first marriage that ends in divorce lasts about seven to eight years. The leading cause of divorce. Basic incompatibility. 43% of marriages end because of basic incompatibility. 22% because of money. Only 28% in because of infidelity and only 6% in because of abuse. So 68-ish percent of marriages in because of basic incompatibility or money. You tell me there's not a problem, a plague in our society. Now, for a long time, I was really careful about teaching and preaching about marriage because I'm young-ish, right? Uh, I'm 42, almost 43, been married for 23, 22 years, <laughs> 20, we've been married a long time, 22 years in August, we'll have been together 27 years in August, so I'm, I'm done saying that I'm too young for this, all right, I've, I've experienced a lot of life and, and marriage and, and goods and bads and all of those things, I've counseled with countless couples, uh, but moreover than that, it's God's word that's speaking the truth today. And so I'm not going to say, oh, I'm too young for this. Right? I, I know so I've, I've walked this journey long enough to know some truths that happen. Let me tell you the, the typical marriage that I see in America and, I, and unfortunately that I see in the church. You get married. Great. You have the honeymoon. Great. You have the, the first season of that kind of honeymoon time and then things change and you start figuring out, oh, this person's flawed. <laughs> They're not perfect. Hold on. I wasn't ready for that. You start to see these flaws, and you're like, what was cute in the beginning comes a little bit annoying. You know how you do that? Because you just stop. You chew loud. You know, like, let's not do that. When, when you're dating, it's like, I love the way you chew loud. I can just hear it. I love to hear that crunch, man. I just love what you're doing. And then life gets serious. You start chasing after the American dream. You start trying to make some money. You start chasing careers, those kind of things, and then kids come along. And life gets really busy. If you have young kids, you know what I'm talking about. Life is just yeah. busy. A lot of the focus becomes on the kids. And nowadays you've got to get them in every single sport and they got to do every single thing. So you've you got to focus all that attention on them. So what happens is all the attention is focused on the kids. And no attention is focused on the marriage at all. And your life becomes making sure your calendars sync up so you get kids to practice and go this way and that way. Before you know it, those things that were flaws are now pet peeves of yours about that other person. And, and, and the love that you felt is starting to fade away. The kids begin to grow up and they're getting busier and busier and you really just, you're just roommates living together. Passing in the hallway, making sure somebody can take this one here and take that one there. At some point you wonder, where did the love go? Typically, the, the, the mom, and I'm going to speak in generalities. You can get mad if you want to. There, there are generally things that are true in this world, okay? And generally, they're for, for female, and generally, they're for male. And if that doesn't suit you, this ain't the church for you. Generally, what happens is the mom focuses a lot of attention on the kids, while the husband focuses a lot of time on, on hobbies or, or work, chasing the dream, all those things. Again, these things are not bad things. But what I have seen in so many couples over and over again, couples that I sat down with, that I've seen with my own eyes, is they begin to drift away. They lose commonality. They lose time together. They lose passion, fire, all of these things. And if they make it to the when the kids graduate, they look across the table at each other and have no idea who they are anymore. And if they stay together for the kids, then that's typically the time when they divorce. Or about seven to eight years into it, it's like, hey, let's just call it now before the kids get too old. Now, I hate that this is the picture of marriage that I've seen, but it's also the truth. And I want to see it very real about it. For some of you, you may be walking that situation right now. 
They say that divorce is in decline right now. For the first time in 50 years, divorce is in decline. And that should be exciting, but do you know why it's in decline? Because fewer people are getting married. They have seen such a broken system with marriage that the younger, this younger generation is just not getting married anymore. Why do it? Why go through all of that? Let's just try this out. Let's just live together. And if it doesn't work out, then let's just call it. Let's not do this whole marriage thing. And so the, the, the divorce rate's falling, but the marriage rate is quickly declining because it's broken and we don't talk about it. <laughs> it's one of the biggest things in every single church. As people are sitting around this, this country in pews and chairs, it's made of families and married couples, and we don't talk about this. Now, here's the bad news about church and divorce. And I've said this several times, and there's, it's true in generality. The divorce rate outside of the church is the same inside the church. Now, now that's true in a sense, but it's a little bit misleading. For those who regularly attend church and make it a priority, the divorce rate is 38%, well below the national average. You get to people who are actually serving and giving and doing, and it declines rapidly from there. And so it's a little bit misleading. It's a lot like how people treat church. If you just come and you just hang out and you just go about your business the rest of the week, then you're just like everyone else anyway. But if you're actually committed and spend time and, and get in the Word and all those things, crazy enough, people stay married a whole lot longer. Now, <laughs> I wanted to get to this point and feel very low right now. <laughs> to tell you that I believe that marriage is the greatest gift that ever God has ever given us while we're here on this earth. And I believe with all of my heart that it can, should be and, and can be the most life-giving, the most godly, the most joyful relationship you could ever have on the face of this earth. And I'm sick and tired of seeing how the world treats marriage. It is a lie from the devil himself. His goal is to destroy and tear down. Because if he can tear down families, he tears down churches. And then he tears down generations. And it's a lie. If your relationship, let me tell you this right now. If your marriage is not the most life-giving relationship in your life right now, you are missing out and it's something is wrong and it needs to change. I'm not going to get up here and tell you that our relationship is perfect, but it's dang near perfect. I'm okay with saying that. Because it is a lie from the world that you have to struggle through this and hope that you can be happy. My favorite thing to do is to go home to my family and to my wife and spend time with her. If I could just, if my entire life could be going on vacation with my wife and then bring my kids every once in a while, I, I would be the happiest person on the face of the earth. Now, do we have things that we battle with? Yes. We don't fight very often, hardly ever. Because, again, that's a lie that you have to fight inside of your relationships and your marriage. That's a lie. Spices things up. You kidding me? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And so I'm not going to get up here and be like, it's, it's a struggle. You just, you got to buckle up, man. Just strap it up. It's going to suck. It's marriage, man. It's just, a, it's just you for life. Just battle each other and then you hope you die and go to heaven. It's the best bull. I love every second of my marriage. It's so stupid. And I'm done with it. And that, you know what it doesn't do? It doesn't honor God at all. You know what God compares marriage to? Jesus and the church. That's how highly he holds marriage. How dare we lower it to some, let's try this out and see if it works. And if it's a little bit hard, let's get out of this. Welcome to Simple Church. If you don't know us, this is who we are. I, I, I don't, I, we're not going to dumb down God's word to be like, well... There are some instances. No. Now, I'll talk about abuse and, and those kind of things. Don't get me wrong. But we are in a non committal. If it's not easy, if it doesn't feel good, let me check out. That's bull. Guess what? There's a lot of days you're not going to feel like you're in love. Love is not a feeling, it's a choice. Do you want to get up and go to your job every day? No. I work at a church and I don't want to. <laughs> we choose to. We choose to. 
Now, there are very practical, very real things that we're going to talk about that make you want to choose it. But the idea that, you know, oh, I don't feel these little butterflies anymore. Well, welcome to being a human being. <laughs> okay, I think, you, I think you've heard my heart and how I feel about this. But we need to get into God's word because there's a lot of truth around marriage. And if you're here, listen, I'm not making light. Please hear me. I'm not making light of the issues that you're walking through. If you're walking through those right now, I'm not saying that life isn't real and tough and things aren't real. But my goodness, why don't we give a little effort to this? You, for some of you, if you give as much effort to your wife as you are that person at work, it may work out a little bit better. If you give a little more attention to the husband instead of the kids, maybe work out a little bit better. If you focus a little more on the relationship instead of running kids everywhere, maybe work out a little bit better. Now, I'm not saying that things aren't real and you're not going to battle things. But, but I feel like, are, are we even trying sometimes? Have you given every single ounce of yourself? Because that's what you promised. Genesis chapter 2. Verse 24, this is where God institutes marriage. So he makes woman, he, he makes this great call to say, hey, man should not be alone. Amen to that. Like, that's a good thing. I completely, I would, y'all, there would not be a simple church here if I was not married. I'm just going to be honest with you. I, I, sometimes I don't know where I'm going. And Amanda keeps my head on straight and she helps me. God knew what he's doing. He's like, hey, man does not need to be alone. Verse 24, he institutes marriage, and this is what it says. This explains th this idea of marriage, two man and woman coming together. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now, the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. So this is, this is the roadmap. This is the blueprint that God created for marriage. God created this, all right? So it is from God. So it is good, and it is perfect, and it is right. And so the fact that we're so easily falling apart from this shows that we are not holding it in the same honor that God does. And so God institutes marriage, one man, one woman for life. That's it. That, that's the, that is how God designed marriage. Anything outside of that is not what God intended for it to be. And I know we as Christians love to go to different places now. Oh, yeah. Get them. Get them. Talk to this world. No, I'm talking to the church. Do you know, I, if, you, if you look through the New Testament about how much Jesus talked about divorce, do you know what they used to do in the Old Testament when people got divorced? They stoned them. God cares a whole lot about marriage and talks a whole lot about how divorce is so wrong. And again, here's, here's the hammer and nail part. I'm not saying that God can't redeem someone who's been divorced. I'm not saying that there is not forgiveness and grace and mercy for all those things. But his plan is one man, one woman, for life. That's it. When we follow that, when that is the mindset, when I, when I understand, when I say these vows, that I'm entering into a covenant. This is, not, this is not a legal document for the state that we can go get. I'm entering into a God-given covenant for life with this other person. When I hold it in that place, it really changes the game. Because then divorce is not an option. Divorce is, is it's not even on the table. Now again, I'm not talking about abuse and some of those things that come along with marriage. I'm, I'm just talking about marriage in general. That when we hold it in the same esteem that God began and created this with, it changes the way that we view it. Now it's like, hey, I'm going to pour all of my energy into this because this is the commitment that I've made. And, and God holds it in this esteem, so I'm going to do that as well. And when we do that, I'm going to make a statement that is going to be so counterculture, cultural, that it's not even funny. When we hold it in that same esteem and we decide that this is what we're going to go after, then I believe that this statement is true right here. Marriage is easy. How many times have you heard that in your life? <laughs> I'm guessing never. Now, stay with me on this. I'm not going to sit here and joke and say marriage is easy in the sense of, like, you're not going to have any problems and things. But I believe that every marriage can come to a place where it is easy. Now, as you see, the I and the S are periodized. I don't know if that's a word. It doesn't matter. But you see that there's something there that we're going to talk about. Here's how you know this is important to me. I made slides. Actually, Cody made slides for me. But 
I don't ever follow slides. I hate following slides because then I'm stuck to what I'm going to say, and I never like doing that. I like the spirit to lead. This is how important this is to me. And I truly believe that if we, will, if we will listen to the word of God, if we listen to some practical information, that marriage can be easy. So we're going to talk about the IS, and I'm actually going to have to switch them, but it didn't make sense if I did C. It, it's kind of the Spanish. I could have said, like, marriage, yes, easy, but I, I, I did it this way. Okay, so just roll with me on this, all right? So the, the S in marriage is easy is selflessness. Selflessness. It really all comes down to this. You want to have a happy, healthy marriage. You want to have happy, healthy relationships. Selflessness is the key. I, I want to read in, in Ephesians. Now, I skipped this whenever we went through this series over these past few months. And so we're going we're gonna to actually finish up Ephesians. And we're going to talk about one of the most debated and just, is, I don't know why there's so many issues with this. But let, let's read it. Starting in verse 21 of chapter 5. This is what it says. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. And in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body but feeds and cares for it just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of the body. So this... <laughs> These scriptures, for some reason, cause so much stir in church. This whole idea of wives submit to your husbands. It's just, uh, when I counsel couples, we always go through this when we talk about role responsibilities in, in a marriage. And it's so interesting to hear what people have to say about it. And I always let, let the, the, the female go first because I want to hear her perspective. And also, if I don't, it puts the husband in a really weird spot. So I try to give him a little bit of grace there, and I say, what, is this, what does this mean to you? I would say 75% of the time now, it's, well, that's outdated. That's just, that's just not true anymore. That's how it was back. That was the culture back then. That's just how it was. And then typically the husband will front, yeah, whatever she says. You know, like, yeah, he's a, you're, you're in training. Good job. I, I, hear, I see what you're doing. And I say, well, that's, it's actually not true. God's word is still very true. Now, there are cultural things that change in the Bible, absolutely. But this word that he has given to us is absolutely still true. There's such a misunderstanding about what this means. But the word is submit. And, and for some reason we get stuck on that one and we don't continue to go to the next verses that talk about literally husbands are called to die to themselves for their marriage. We get stuck on the submit thing. He, let me just say this about this and then I'm, I'm going to move on because I don't have a lot of time to camp here. This has nothing to do with value. That's the problem that we've created, that somehow submitting means that there is a value ranking inside of marriage. No one is more valuable than anyone else inside of your marriage, okay? It's not a value thing. As a matter of fact, Paul is going to share about cha completely changing the culture. As a matter of fact, he calls us equals. He says, now there's, there's no more female or male. What he's talking about is, hey, we're all equal in Christ now. There's no ranking order in this. I'm, I'm going I'm to share a little bit more about that because it's really important to understand. But I hate how much we get caught up on that, this little section here. When Paul comes in and he re reiterates what this is actually all about. Verse 33, this is how he ends this section. So again I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, these phrases that he uses are must, mandatory, part of the covenant. And he uses the word agape. We know that word really well. It means unconditional love. So the man is supposed to, supposed to agape the wife as he has himself. Unconditionally love the husband. What we don't ever hear is that the wife is called to unconditionally respect the husband. Now, this is going to be something brand new, but I want you to hear this. Hear this whole verse. Don't get caught up in the submit and the love and all the, that. that if you get caught up in that, you're missing the whole point. The point Paul is saying is, this is about selflessness. 
if we have two people who are selfless, who are following Christ, who are trying to be the best version of themselves, and they're loving each other, you're not going to have any issues with what's going on here in these verses. When, you, when it's just about, hey, how can I love you? How can I please you? How can I be there for you? How can I respect you? And both sides are doing that. It doesn't matter about this verbiage and how it's written. It's about let me be selfless in this relationship and be here for what you need. Here, here is a truth, and, and I want to share from, from this book because this was, there's two books that, that were really life-giving for Amanda and I. And one is Love and Respect, which I'm going to talk about today by Dr. Egriches. And then the second one was The Five Love Languages, Gary Chapman. Really, really helpful. If you're looking for some marriage books to guide you, I think both of those are really, really good. But, but here's the truth about men and women. Again, this is generalities, but this is generally true, and that's okay. Women value and need love. Men value and need respect. Now, this is new because we focus so much on love that I think that we've missed the idea of respect that those two things go together. So the entire idea is selflessness, and if I have two people who are, are following Christ, who are growing closer to, to God, they're going to grow closer together. If I seek to value and honor that other person over myself, I'm going to have a pretty successful marriage, I can promise you that, and that's true for any relationship, if I'm seeking to value them above myself. Here's the covenant part that gets really difficult. A husband is called to obey the command to love his wife, even if she does not obey the command to respect him. A wife is called to obey the command to respect her husband, even if he does not obey the command to love her. That's counterintuitive. That's countercultural. That's counter, certainly against everything that we've heard about marriage. Now, let me pause here. There are very specific things that the Bible talks about to, to get out of. I'm not saying that you need to stay in an abusive relationship. If, if they, and it is, it's generally the, the man that, that's doing the abusing. He has lost the right to be called your husband. And the same is true of a woman. If she's doing that, she has lost the right to be called your wife. I'm not talking about staying in that abusive relationship. I'm not talking about staying in, in a relationship that, that's marred with infidelity. Although the Bible says, even in those instances, if you can stay and win that person over, that is huge. Okay, so I'm not talking about, hey, just remain in this, this you know, horrible, abusive relationship at all. But in general, because you know, 60 whatever percent of marriage is in because of reasons, basic incompatibility and money, right? If we change the mindset that I'm staying, that I'm, that I'm sticking this out, that I'm going to love and respect, even if they don't, I promise you it will change everything about the way that your marriage works. I want to read in 1 Peter chapter 3 because I, I know that's really uncomfortable to hear that I'm supposed to love if they don't respect or I'm supposed to respect if they don't love. But this, this, is, this is what Peter says in Scripture. In the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then, even if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. They will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. Scripture says, hey, even someone who doesn't know Christ, even someone, if you've gotten into that relationship now, the Bible also talks a lot about not partnering yourself with someone who's not equally yoked as you. Don't, don't get with someone who's not on the same path to, to God with you. Young people, let me just tell you this, the best thing you can do, the number one thing that you can mark as who I need in a partner is do they follow Jesus. That's the number one thing. I promise you. And the Bible is very clear about that. But it also says if you're with someone who is not following the good news, Hey, try to win them over by the way that you respect and love them. And then in, in verse, where am I at? verse 7, it says, In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should so your prayers will not be hindered. So again, the Bible makes it very clear that it's not about if, if I get love, then I give respect. If I get respect, then I get love. Now, this doesn't mean that women don't want respect and that men don't want love. I love how love and respect says it, that it's like food and water. You can typically go about 30 to 40 days without food before you die of starvation. You can only go about three days without water. So, so have this mindset. Mindset: Respect is like water for men and love is like food. 
and the reverse is true for the wife. Okay? That love is like water, and, and respect is like food. So these, it's not that these things aren't desired by the other people, but these are the, this is what men want respect. And there's so many, you can read so much data about uh, statistics and all these things about how that's what men want. Men would rather uh, feel unloved and left alone in the world than to be disrespected. Because that's our natural desire. And again, we live in a world now where we can't say that. And it's ridiculous because it's so true. We were created this way as male and female to have these things and feel these ways. And that's a good thing. That's how God created us. We should celebrate these differences that we have. That's, that's a really, really good thing. And it's also really important that we continue to celebrate these differences because if we're going to fix anything, if we're going to work on anything, then these things have to be true and we have to be able to work on them. And so these are, these are the things that are generally true. But here's what happens in a lot of marriages. And maybe this is the description of your marriage. We get busy, we don't spend time with each other, we get annoyed by each other. Uh, she's not meeting my needs, so I'm not going to love her. She's not respecting me as, as the man of this household, so I'm, I'm going to withhold my love. I'm going to go spend more time at the office, I'm going to you know, hang out with my buddies more. And she's like, well, he's not loving me, he's not showing me love. And so you know what, I'm withholding everything from him, and I'm going to do my thing. Before you know it, that's how life is. And for six, seven years, you wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, we haven't... We haven't been intimate. We, haven't, we, we don't really ever talk anymore. And, and what made this so clear is, is in this Bible, or in, not in the Bible, in this book, Love and Respect, he has what's called the crazy cycle. And if you'll bring this picture up, and I think that this is, describes so many marriages that without love, she reacts without respect. And without respect, he re- reacts without love. And you see how the cycle continues and continues and continues. And for years and years and years, you can be in this pattern. Well, if you're not meeting my needs, I'm not going to meet your needs. And then I'm not going to meet your needs, and you're not going to meet my needs. And it's just a, it's the crazy cycle. And unfortunately, I see so many people living in this and thinking this is what marriage is. This is never what God intended. Never what God intended it to be. And if this is a picture of your marriage, this, this, you're not living true marriage. Let me just tell you this right now. But... There is hope. There is a fix for it. I truly believe this. It starts with selflessness. It starts with understanding that I, my call, my covenant that I made is that I need to treat that person better than I treat myself. Now, it's not easy to do when you're walking through this cycle right here. If you've ever been in that, that position in your marriage where you just really, if it was legal to punch him, like... You know what I'm saying? I, I, I'm, I'm okay with being real. There's, I'm sure there's seasons in, in your life, and, and you know, I, I don't think Amanda's ever felt that way, but there may have been one or two times that I said something from stage, and she really wanted to punch me when we got home. But if you're walking through this season, then this changing that sounds, well, how do I do that? If They better change, and then I'll change. Well, I think it's with the eye. And so selfless, selflessness is the key. But to actually set an emotion, it's the I, and that's intentionality. I think those are the two, everything that I can think of that I've seen in marriage, that I've seen people struggle with, come down to intentionality and selflessness. People do not, it's about them and their needs in their relationship, and they spend no time actually working on and being intentional in their marriage. And we wonder how we get to these places where we're, you know, we're no longer in love or we're no longer feeling these things. How intentional have you been in that relationship? Husband, how intentional have you been about loving your wife more than you love yourself? Wife, how, how intentional have you been about showing respect to your husband more so than you would ever show to yourself? We don't do that. We don't talk about that. Those aren't the things that we do. We were never taught these things. We're just taught, oh, you guys should love each other. No, how are you intentionally doing that? How are you setting time aside for your marriage? If you don't have time, guess what? Your kids need to stop whatever they're doing. Little, little Timmy's baseball career is not more important than your marriage. He has a .00001% of making it. And I've seen you, and he's not going to make it, okay? <laughs> Let's just be real. We sacrifice our marriages at the altar of sports. Isn't that crazy? The most important and life-giving relationship is, is sacrificed at the altar of busyness. It's insanity. Everything should come second to that. Our, our relationship with God first, our relationship with our spouse second, everything else. 
How are you being intentional? When we become intentional, when we actually start spending time, taking time, doing these things, you will see immediately how God impacts. When you, if, if you take two people who just are at the wit's end in their marriage, they bring in selflessness, they bring in intentionality, I promise you that marriage can be changed. Now, not overnight, but I promise you that marriage can become the most life-giving relationship. I have seen it live in person over and over again. But here's the truth. If you're serious about changing your marriage, you will make a way. If you're not serious, you'll make an excuse. Oh, that's good information, but you don't understand her. Well, that's, that's good information, but you don't understand how he. It's either going to be the most life-giving relationship in your, in your world or not. And I'm running a little short on time, but that, I don't care. Zach, our new kids pastor, is back there. He's going to absolutely kill me. But we've been friends for like 40 years now, so he, he'll be fine. I, w- I want to read this because this, this is the idea of intentionality, and this is really important for, for us to understand. You, you have to understand, wives, that, that men want to be the hero. That is a natural, God-given thing to them. That's not arrogance. That's not, oh, we can't say that in this world. This is a natural thing that God has given them. That's a good thing. Otherwise, they wouldn't accomplish things. We wouldn't have the earth populated. You know, if we didn't have any kind of desire, it would be really, really bad. And women want to be cherished. Those are good things. We've got to celebrate those. And that's what he talks about here. And I want to read this. It's a little bit lengthy, but I think that he says it so well. And again, if you're hammer and nails, you're not going to like this, but that's fine. It is as though she is the princess and he is the prince. In Ephesians 5.33, a husband has a need to be respected as the head, the one called upon to die. Christ is the head and loved the church and gave himself up for her. The prince goes into battle for the princess, not vice versa. Consequently, the princess does not seek to be respected as the head. Instead, she yearns to be honored, valued, and prized as a precious equal, a fellow heir of grace of life. To carry further the word picture of the prince and the princess, I believe the biblical order of things is that as prince, the husband is to be considered first among equals. Now again, if you're a hammer looking for nails, here you go. By that, I mean he is her equal, but he is called upon to be the first to provide, protect, and even to die if necessary. And let me tell you this, if you're a husband who lords this some kind that you're in charge over your wife, you are so biblically inaccurate, it's not even funny. She is equal value to you. You're called first to die. You want to be the head of something? Be the head of of dying to yourself first. You want to be a man? That's what a man looks like. I I don't have time to go down this rabbit hole. We've we've come to this idea that somehow if I hunt and fish and I, I do man stuff, that I'm somehow a man. You're a man if you love your wife well. You're a man if she's more important to you than any other relationship in this world. I don't have time for this. It's true. It is. I'm just trying to think about Zach and the kids' workers, man. He's called to die if necessary. This is graphically illustrated on any sinking ship as lifeboats are put over the side. The cry is always what? Women and children first. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's not an accident that in every culture, As a rule, men are bigger and stronger than women. Is this not God's visual aid concerning his purpose for men? We have got to stop trying to strip men of their masculinity. We were called by God to lead. Now, have some people messed that up? Absolutely. Have some men taken advantage of that? Absolutely. But that does not change the call for us to love and protect and die for our wives and for for our people. And that we're not going to let the world strip that away. Something in a man longs for his wife to look up to him as he fulfills this role. And when she does, it motivates him, not because he is arrogant, but because of how God has constructed him. Few husbands walk around claiming, I'm first among equals. The husband with good will and good sense knows this isn't his right, but it's his responsibility. She, on the other hand, possesses something within that thirsts to be valued as first in importance. Nothing energizes her more. She is not self-centered. God placed this in her by nature. When he honors her as first in importance and she respects him as first among equals, their marriage works. 
when we become intentional, it's got to start with selflessness. You're, you're going to have to pray that you actually step into a place where you believe those, those covenant words that you said, that rich or poor, you know, whatever set of vows you decided to use, that whatever, come, come what may, I choose you. And you're going to have to go back to that commitment. And you're going to have to pray to God that, hey, give me the strength to do this. And then it becomes about intentionality. Now let me meet your needs where you need to be met. For, for wives, that's to respect your husband. When you go out and you talk to your friends about how bad of a dog he is, you are disrespecting him and you're going right against God's word. Now, I'm not saying don't have friends that you share stuff with, but you know what I'm talking about. You get these gangs together to talk about how bad your husbands are. It's no wonder divorce is so rampant in our world. I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate about this, okay? And part of me wants to apologize, but part of me knows that this needs to be said. Here's the beautiful thing. And this is what Amanda and I experienced, and, and this was such a light to us. We had a good marriage our first five years. We discovered some things that went from good to great, and it has just been growing. And I'll tell you this, when our marriage grew the most and got the closest is after we had kids. Again, another lie that somehow kids, you know, like you grow apart. Bull, if you want to, you will. If you choose the kids over your marriage, my kids, no. You can ask them today. Who comes first? Mom comes first. You disrespect mom, you're getting, oh, you're getting people's elbow. They know that. I choose mom. Mom's always right. Even when mom's wrong, mom's right. They know that. Now, we had some great people in our life. We had my in-laws watched our kids often. And that's, listen, this is, I don't have time to get into all this. Sorry. That's, that's the purpose of community, man. We need to be coming along and helping these younger couples. And I wish I had more time to talk about that. Here's the deal. When we, we take selflessness on. I'm going to take selflessness on because this, this, this relationship is the most important thing in my life. And I become intentional about it. Okay, let me see what I can do. How can I meet that need? How can I respect? How can I love? We get on this right here, what's called the energizing cycle. And there we go. His love motivates her respect, and her, her respect motivates his love. And it is a beautiful cycle. And I'm telling you right now, we've been on the cycle for 17 years now. And it, it rings true. And here's the cool part about this. As you do this, as you become intentional, what happens is you see when the crazy cycle starts to sneak back up again. Because it's never going to be perfect. Satan's always going to come. He always wants to separate, always wants to destroy, break down the house from inside. Right? Because you're never fighting against each other. That's the, the dumbest thing. We're going to talk about that when we talk about communication. You're never fighting against each other. You're fighting the enemy. You should be fighting it together. But when you do that, you start to see when, when the, something breaks. And then someone's like, you know what? No. I'm getting this off this crazy cycle. We're getting back on to the energizing cycle, and I'm telling you right now, this will be the most life-fulfilling, most life-giving thing you can ever do, and it's the greatest gift that you can give to your kids. You know what the greatest gift you can give your kids is? A healthy marriage. Not all the sports stuff they need. Not, again, nothing wrong with sports. My kids play a ton of sports. They're, it's fine, but if it's overrunning your marriage, there is a problem that needs to be fixed. The greatest gift that you can give your family, your kids, is a healthy marriage, and when you become intentional, with selflessness, it bleeds down into every part of your marriage. When you become intentional about communication, demonstrating love, when you become uh, intentional about intimacy, you will see the joy and the life-giving. And we're going to talk about all of these things. And we're going to be very real about them. But when you do this and get on the energizing cycle, you can get on that and stay on it for the rest of your marriage, I promise you. And you can finish well, and you can, you can change the narrative of marriage in this world. Dr. Eggerich, is, he, he does, you know, he'll do these seminars and things. People always come up and ask him, who should be the one to break the crazy cycle? It's a good question. His answer is, whoever's more mature. Whoever cares enough about this relationship to step up and do it. They just do it. And it's crazy how things begin to change when one person changes something. Now, again, it may not be overnight. If you've been in a struggling marriage for several years, it's going to take a little while to change things. But I also believe that God can work miracles very quickly because that's what God can do when we turn it over to him. If you're serious about changing your marriage, you'll find a way. If you're not, you'll find an excuse. We're going to talk about very practical things over the next couple of weeks. And, and a lot of these will filter into other relationships and, and how we parent kids and all those things. But today I really wanted to get very real about marriage. And if you're here and you have a struggling marriage, I want you to hear me. God can redeem it. He can make it the greatest relationship you've ever seen. Uh, he can make you more joyful and happy than you've ever been. You've got to start by turning it over to him. You've got to start by turning it over to him. You've got to start by removing yourself and thinking about the other person first and then getting very, very intentional 
about how to love or respect that other person. You do that, and it's going to bring you more joy than you've ever seen in your entire life, and all the good things fall along with that. And, and I'm telling you, you will, you will have a different view of what marriage can be. I, I, I just believe that for the church, that this is the tide that's going to change. And it's got to start inside you. Once again, thank you for stopping by today. We'd love for you to be a part of our family at one of our services at 9 or 11 on Sunday. You can find out all of our information at simplechurchtulsa.com. And we'd love to pray for you any way we can. So please message us and we hope you have a great week.